Welcome to Reigniting You, the show that explores a variety of topics and timely issues for making successful mid to late career transitions with a renewed sense of purpose and fulfillment for the next phase of your career and life, regardless of your age. Now, here's your host, Lisa Downs. Welcome to Reigniting You, where we talk all things career transition for those age 40 plus. I'm Lisa Down, Seattle-based career and retirement transition coach. Happy to be here with you today and our producer, Eric. Hey, Eric, how are you? How are you today? I can talk. <laughs> Spit out the word. I'm having trouble talking today, too. <laughs> I don't know what it is about uh, today, but yeah, stumbling time along. Time change. <laughs> I think that definitely played into I just I blame everything into. this week on the time change. That's right. That's right. Yeah, uh, next few days, you know, it's like it always takes me a couple of weeks to get used to it. I think. I, you know, it should not be it a big not, deal. I you know, mean, it really shouldn't, now, but, but uh, yeah. it always is. <laughs> <laughs> they, they've got legislation, you know, working its way through Congress to get rid of the time change, and I'm all for that. Um, but, uh, you know, I understand how some people would not be, but I am definitely for it. Yeah, I just, I mean, got my fingers crossed. I don't, I don't really care which one they go with. I just yeah. want to stop the insanity of moving the clocks and I'm on, messing with our biorhythms. I'm our on team DST. Rhythms. Are you? Uh, per <laughs> permanent daylight saving side. Yeah. Let's go with that. <laughs> there uh, you go. But, uh, you know, yeah. uh, I mainly just the change is, is rough for some reason. But, um, you know, despite all that, we've got a great show ahead. We do. We've got a great show. My guest today is senior housing consultant Adrian Miller. First, though, are a few career-related stories from the news in the last few days. Many Americans who retired early during the pandemic are delaying claiming Social Security benefits so they can get larger monthly payments in the future, as analyzed by the Washington Post. The number of workers applying for benefits in the year ending in September fell 5% from the same period last year, according to the Social Security Administration. During the same time frame, retirements among workers in the 65 to 69 age group went up 5%. America's retiree population grew by roughly 3 million people during the pandemic, about double the rate of pre-pandemic trends. The surge in delaying Social Security is another data point that illustrates the unusual trends in the labor market these days. General Electric announced that it will break up its conglomerate into three companies, reports the Associated Press. The company already rid itself of some of its products, including appliances and light bulbs. Its stock started losing value back in 2001, the waning days of Jack Welch's tenure as CEO, though it has improved by 30% this year as it sells off more assets. GE's aviation unit, its most profitable, will keep the General Electric name, though the company will spin off its healthcare business in early 2023 and its energy segment in 2024. The move could signal the end of conglomerates as they may no longer work well in today's marketplace of agility and a need to act quickly without being bogged down by bureaucracy. The split could cost around $2 billion in operational costs when it's all said and done. So Eric, what are your thoughts on these first couple of, of stories? interesting stuff yeah the ge one uh was a surprise to me i don't think i've heard i have not heard of a company doing this of splitting up rather than just absorbing everything in their wake um except for when they were forced to do so because they were considered a monopoly like yeah. uh you know at&t back in the right. day when they had to break up to the baby bells and stuff yeah um so this is really uh you know interesting stuff um and it'll be of course, interesting to see how that plays out. It, it makes sense to me because when a company is uh, able to focus on one particular thing and just do that well, it seems like it's going to run a lot smoother than trying to incorporate a whole bunch of disparate, uh, you right, know, yeah. products and stuff together. Um, I mean, at one point, you know, they owned NBC, you know, and they're, yeah. they make light bulbs and ovens and planes and late night with David Letterman, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> it just, it didn't make a lot of sense lot to of me sense. at the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, and now you've got Comcast 
yes you, you know nbc and universal and all that stuff is right. one one conglomerate you know and i've i've been out of it i didn't even realize that they stopped making appliances yeah or, neither like, did i wow. like, the yeah. appliances we have in our townhome are ge oh okay yeah, and i i didn't even realize <laughs> that i guess they're out of warranty that was right ben <laughs> oh okay <laughs> didn't even know that part yeah and uh yeah and now with the the breakup but but you know, I, it is a good point. You know, it's just uh, things in business today and just overall, it's, you know, you've got to be nimble. You've got to be flexible. You have to be able to, you know, pretty much turn on a dime, as they say, as things happen and change happens and, you know, circumstances like what we've been through the last couple of years. And right. um, you've got to be, you know, you can't necessarily be this behemoth mm -hmm. uh, trying to you know, turn around and do something different and, and do it quickly. Sometimes being lean and mean you know is mean, the man. way to go. <laughs> sure, you know, it's like I've, I've worked in big companies before and uh, um, where it's, you know, everything has to be decided by a committee mm -hmm. and where you have to have the pre-meeting yep. to figure out what, you know, how <laughs> you're going to approach things in the actual meeting. Right. And then there's the actual meeting and then there's the post-meeting. To talk about it and what happened and uh yeah it's just sometimes the and that eats up a lot of eats time up a yeah. lot of time it's a huge time suck definitely let alone soul sucking i'll just say <laughs> <laughs> i'll put that in too absolutely yeah. absolutely i think we've all been there yeah pretty much but um yeah it's just, it's interesting so you know we'll kind of see what happens with them and and then the, you know, delaying of folks taking Social Security, I think, you know, a lot of people, that's part of their financial plan and their retirement plan is mm -hmm. to delay that as much as possible so they can get uh, bigger checks uh, when that happens. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just like the whole retirement uh, planning is, you know, to save money while you can because, you know, in the future you're going to be making less of it yeah. and you know, paying less taxes on it so you know it makes sense to kind of people do that already with 401ks and uh roth iras and stuff so it makes sense you know social security might work like that as well yeah yeah and not surprising about the the number of people who have hit retirement i you know there, there are so many who were either forced into or decided to take early retirement here the last year and a half or so and it's like, well, you know, when presented with a package, um, you know, often it's it can be the better choice. Yeah. Uh, depending on your situation or say, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll take the package from here. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, you know, still maybe have plans to work a little bit, too, or do part time work or something. I wonder if we'll than... see a boom in um, entrepreneurship uh, from folks over the age of say 50 or 60 yeah. because mm -hmm. there has been a lot of people that uh, kind of ended up retiring sooner than they felt like they wanted to give up working you know um, and you know being in control without necessarily having uh, uh, that feeling that failure is going to ruin you <laughs> it, it's got to be an empowering thing so you know um, maybe we'll we'll see you know, yeah. a lot of new companies and startups, you know. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. And I know, well, we've, you know, talked to Charlie McGee before, you know, from FanNet. And mm -hmm. he's been on the show a few times. And, um, you know, and he talks about how there are some franchisees, so people he helps place with different franchise opportunities that are, you know, in their 60s. Yeah. In their 60s. Uh, so, you know, Never say never. <laughs> you know, it's I mean, it makes sense to me. Yeah. You've got, you know, all these years of experience mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it, it, you could run a company yourself, yeah. you know, yeah. after being at a company right. for 30, 40 years, you know. Yeah. So, or, you know, if you got a little bit saved aside or take yeah. your severance and invest it, you know, in a franchise as a way to get off the ground when you've got structure already there for you, some infrastructure. Right. Why not? Yeah, it could make a lot of sense. So now I'm interesting to see how that plays out, too. Uh, a couple other stories here for you. So the Internal Revenue Service is still sending out tax refunds for 2020, about 430,000 of them to taxpayers who paid taxes on unemployment compensation that was excluded from income 
After a change in federal income tax rules, the Detroit Free Press reports that the refunds will put more than $510 million into people's wallets, averaging payments of $1,189 each. The IRS has been issuing these unemployment-related refunds for months now that stem from the signing of the American Rescue Plan Act in March of this year. So far, the IRS has issued more than 11.7 million of these types of refunds that total $14.4 billion and has identified more than 16 million taxpayers who may be eligible for this refund. Lastly, in the world of what not to do on the job, a metallurgist in Washington state pleaded guilty to fraud charges after she spent decades faking the results of strengths test on steel used to make U.S. Navy submarines, reports the Associated Press. She faces up to 10 years in prison and a $1 million fine when she's sentenced this coming February. She falsified the results of strength tests for at least 240 productions of steel, about half the steel the foundry she worked for in Tacoma produced for the Navy, between 1985 through 2017. No submarine hulls failed as a result, though the Navy incurred increased cost and maintenance. When confronted with the doctored results, she told investigators that in some cases she changed the test results because the Navy's requirement that steel tests be conducted at negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit was quote, unquote, stupid. There you go, Eric. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea, G. Bad, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wow. What do we say to that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, well, I'm glad I don't have to be on a submarine, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> That's very worrying, you yes. know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's, it's critical that, you know, uh, that. Boggles uh, the mind. Yeah, yeah. The steel is as strong as it's supposed to be, you yeah. know? So, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you're busted. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. And hopefully, I mean, I'm glad to hear that no holes failed, but still, yes, it's all disconcerting. That's scary stuff. Yeah. Scary stuff. And uh, yeah. And I just, you know, it just amazes me. And, and maybe this is a sign of my increasing age. But it, it just amazes me that we're in this day and age where I have, you know, I don't agree with it, or that's not my opinion. Mm -hmm. So thusly, therefore, it's wrong. Right. And I can do whatever I want. And I can I do whatever I want because yeah. it's, I don't agree. Yeah. That's not how things are supposed yeah. to work. It's like, <laughs> I just, yeah. So that one was a, amazing. Quite the puzzler. Definitely. And I mean, <laughs> you know, I live in Tacoma. I, I love Tacoma, yep. but... Uh, we, we don't need more black eyes like, <laughs> like this lady. Uh, that's for that's sure. Right. You're giving T-Town a bad name. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you Knock it off. Don't need to do that. <laughs> don't need to do that. That's right. Yeah. Pretty amazing. Yeah. But, you know, in good news, people are getting more tax refunds. So that's, that's exciting, even though it's coming like a year later than you would think. But, right. uh, but yeah, but that's pretty cool. So Well, there's the, you know, the inflation that's out there. And, of course, some people blame the fact that people have more money for the inflation. But really, it's the supply chain stuff that uh, causes a lot of it. And, you know, to make up for that inflation, people actually need that more money. They do. So, you know, and this is good news for sure. Yeah, yeah. good news for it's sure. It's not going to stop some people from spinning th that as being the cause of inflation, but, you know. Yeah, again. yeah, but it's good. And, uh, yeah, it's good to see, you know, more money in people's pockets. And mm -hmm. then, yeah, hopefully, as you said, to offset that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because I just saw it uh, today online um, how much inflation has jumped again. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, from, from what I've seen and read, you know, hopefully uh, that'll start to turn around and calm down again once we get more into 2022. You know, hopefully um, everything going on with um, shipping, you know, right now and supply right. chain and getting goods uh, will improve too over time, we can hope. Yeah, um, fingers crossed fingers the crossed. Uh, steel holds out on those ships that are bringing That's all right. the goods. <laughs> <laughs> and services to folks yeah. hopefully our friend who's been 
operating since yeah. 1985 <laughs> has not uh, negatively impacted any of the shipping. Yeah, it doesn't say if, if it was yeah. exclusively the Navy that got hosed by this lady. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it could have been other yeah. companies and ships yeah. and stuff. So, uh, yeah, it's always, always interesting. You never know what's going to come out. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's <laughs> very <laughs> true. Well, thanks, Eric. So it's time for our first break. When we come back, I'll introduce our guest for the show, Adrian Miller, who is here to talk about making the transition into senior housing and more. Are you feeling challenged or frustrated without a plan for what's next in your career and life? Are you seeing writings on the wall for needing to make a mid to late career change and don't know how or what to do? Coach Lisa Downs of New Aspect Coaching can guide you to what's next, providing a fresh perspective and supporting you to create a clear and compelling vision for your future and a plan to move forward. Call Lisa at 425-216-3015. That's 425-216. 163015 New Aspect Coaching Fresh Perspectives for Your Career Welcome back to Reigniting You, the show that focuses on all aspects of making mid to late career transitions. I'm your host Lisa Downs. A note that you can catch the show Voices of Experience with host Paul Casey this Wednesday at 3 p.m. here on KIXI. Voices shines a light on people with experience in their fields of travel, public affairs, adventure, health, and fitness, with an emphasis on sustaining your own business. That's Voices of Experience this Wednesday at 3 o'clock. I'm happy to introduce today's guest, Adrian Miller. Adrian is the owner and chief care officer of Forever Care Services, a senior housing referral agency that works with seniors and their families to find the best fit in senior residential care. Adrian has spent her career in connecting people and businesses with the services they need and considers working with seniors as an honor. Her role at Forever Care Services is to reduce the overwhelming options in senior care to what fits the needs and wants of those who come to her for assistance. Hi, Adrian. Welcome to the show. So glad that you're here. Thank you, Lisa. It's great to be here. I appreciate you asking me on. Absolutely. And uh, I always like to start with guests, kind of a tradition here on the show to learn about your career path and journey. So what's the story of how you've gotten to this point in your career to date? Well, I am one of those that I think I've held just about every job except serving tables that somehow or other everybody else has had that one and I missed it. So I've been everything from an export lumber broker, a English teacher in Japan, um, but most of my career, I was in hospitality and travel. Um, so I don't have a background in the senior industry, but I do have kind of a history of connecting people with needs and wants. A lot of services, everything from, again, export lumber, finding the right lumber for Japanese trading companies, to actually planning large corporate events, including weddings. And so those are key opportunities to make sure that those connections go well. And uh, all of that really led me to wanting to connect people in maybe a little more meaningful way than just planning a large corporate meeting. And so I had an opportunity um, through placing a family member and helping through that um, actually journey, I guess I would call it. Um, and I woke up one day and, and realized that's what I wanted to be doing for other families. So that's what brought me here. Cool. Well, yeah, don't, uh, I, I've never waited tables either. <laughs> there's well, two of us there we then. go yeah <laughs> never never done that never worked in fast food uh so the, the closest i came was being a hostess at a restaurant so uh, i just had to, had to greet and seat people uh, well i did make pizza i oh, there, so there I, I, I i didn't serve it but i actually made them so <laughs> <laughs> well there we go i say that counts make pizza. <laughs> so um so that's that's really cool and and sounds like some good experiences too, to kind of help pave the way for you uh, with, with your current career. And I'm curious about, um, I'm sure over time and working in those different industries and, you know, teaching English in Japan and, and uh, working in hospitality, you've probably learned a lot. So what would you say are some key lessons that stand out to you? 
Um, well, back when I was in sales, I had a mentor, a sales manager who told me the first person who talks loses. And I'm not sure that's always the case, but what it taught me was that you really need to listen and you need to listen to hear, not to listen to respond. And so working with families, working with seniors, I really need to listen to what those needs and wants are so that I can find the best fit for them in senior housing. And so probably that was one of the biggest lessons was because I am a big talker to actually be quiet and listen. And then from there, um, I have a much better position in, in being able to help people. So that's probably the number number one lesson. And, and secondly, people like to do business with people they like. And um, I learned a long time ago, I, I can't want everybody, well, I can want everybody like me, but the reality is not everyone will. So I may not be the perfect fit for every family and what they need to do is find their perfect fit. But I hope that most people will like me and like the service that I provide and will want to work with me. And to follow up on that, um, what have you personally done to work on your listening skills and, and also being okay knowing that you may not be a fit for everyone? Took a long time. Uh, I'm a people pleaser and I like everyone liking me. And that probably was a hard lesson to actually really take in and, and be okay with. But I, I've gotten there because I realized that I don't want to work with everyone. There are people that just aren't the right fit for me. So I can't expect that, that I'm the right fit for everyone else. And if that's the case, what I want to do is provide them with a referral to someone who might be the right fit. Uh, the listening skills, that's been over a lifetime, uh, but one of the key things was actually I'm a coach at a, a teen girls leadership camp in Arizona in the summer. In the last couple of years, we haven't been able to do it due to COVID, yeah. but we teach listening skills to teenage girls, which is a group that may not be known for listening skills. <laughs> and what I learned at camp uh, as a coach was that there's three levels of listening. You know, level one, you're in your own head, you're, you're listening, but not necessarily paying attention. And that's where most of us sit. Level two, you're actually listening to what someone's saying, you're taking it in, and you you're, don't have the thoughts of, you know, what am I making for dinner happening at the same time. And then level three, which most of us don't necessarily sit at, is really that intuition listening. You are you are inside that other person. And so most of us sit at level one. I try and be at level two, uh, take my busy brain and turn it off and I can plan dinner later. And if I'm really working well, I get to level three. And that's important in the industry I work in to try and sit between that, those two levels. Oh, great. Yeah, great points and very true, right? So the more we can sit back and listen and get to those deeper levels, the two and the three, uh, just the better off our interactions and relationship and, and all of that good stuff for sure. So thanks for sharing that. And, uh, and I'm also wondering what else has been helpful for you as you made your different career transitions, you know, going from different industries and then transitioning into what you do now, whether it was um, people who supported you, certain decisions you made, resources. Um, I've been fortunate to, as I mentioned, I've had a lot of different jobs and in there I've had some really good folks who understood and taught me that uh, the listening skills for one, um, but also saw something in me that I may not have known I was ready for and pushed me to take that next leap, that next step. Um, I think that uh, sitting still isn't my strong suit. And I have always been willing to make a leap when things looked like that was a good move for me. And it's not a matter of quitting things too early or trying to jump jobs. Uh, it was more that I was willing when I saw an opportunity, instead of being scared of it, to actually being willing to embrace it, no matter how scary it was. And I think that that has done uh, very well for me overall, uh, and being able to trust other people when they say that I'm ready for something or I can accomplish something when even I might not think I'm ready for that, but being open to that coaching, that wisdom, 
that knowledge that somebody else can bring to me and see in me the ability to, uh, to, to do that. So again, it kind of comes back to those listening skills, I guess, and, and accepting of what others say. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, sounds to me like a lot of courage too, right? So, you know, doing the thing anyway, even when we have fear. So. Yeah, it's it's not always easy. And sometimes, you know, the knees are shaking under the desk as you're sitting at that table. But it, it's kind of like the duck, as long as the paddling is under the water and it's all calm on top, yeah. <laughs> it, it, somehow you move forward. Very true, for sure. And, um, and uh, were there ever times when you regretted a career move or decision that you, you know, when you went a certain path and thought, oh, you know, maybe I should have taken a different path? Many years ago, when I finished university, I had studied Japanese and I decided to move to Japan to be an English teacher. And I got over there and I enjoyed it and I taught English, but I wasn't an education major and I, I was a communications major and, and thought I would somehow end up in business. And after a, a, about a year and a half, I really thought I was missing something. I thought I had set my career on hold and that I really needed to get back. I needed to get back into that track. And I think that I might've come back too soon. I could have learned more being there. And I really wasn't missing anything, but that fear, then when I came back, I jumped into a couple of jobs that weren't the right fit. They were, they were just a job. And the thing that that taught me was to slow down and really take a look at I didn't have the next 40 years figured out, but I didn't need to jump into something that was the wrong fit mm -hmm. and to slow down long enough to evaluate why was I interested in a job or not? Is this someone that I could work for? Um, I am passionate about what I do and I did learn that I couldn't work for someone that I didn't respect and jumping into a job to get a paycheck, it didn't last. Yeah. So there were a couple of jobs I kind of jumped into because I was worried about the career path or the paycheck and they didn't work out. And the lesson there was to take my time and, and be smart about it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. With you there. I'd been there and done that too a few times. <laughs> and yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting to do that work. I think, you know, to, to, as you've done and, um, you know, to really, spend some time doing that introspection, that self-reflection. It's like, okay, so what was the motivator behind making this move? And right. then, yeah, you know, how can I avoid going down that same road in the future? And as you said, just, you know, sitting back and taking some time and really thinking it through. Um, that's great. So yeah, it makes I, a difference. I applaud you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank uh, you. It's not easy. It's not easy, especially when we're in the moment, right? And, and going through it. So yeah. Great. And, and for those who are going through um, change and transition, uh, what recommend, recommendations do you have for how they can stay uh, motivated, persevere, and stay positive when it can be such an upheaval? Uh, change scares just about everyone. Uh, and, and I think it, it should. When we get out of our status quo, sometimes that's where danger lies. But change can be positive instead of negative. Um, if I think about the changes that happened in my life, I left home and went to college and that was a little scary, but it, it helped me grow up. I left and went to Japan all on my own. Um, I had a job, but I didn't go with anyone else. And that was big change. And it, it set me up for several job positions when I got back. I ended up as an export lumber broker, lumber broker dealing with Japanese trading companies. I wouldn't have done that without that change. Um, even having my kids was a huge change in my life, but one that is, it was very positive. So I think that a lot of us look at change, not only as a scary thing, but as a negative thing. And I think that if you put it in perspective, that change brings positivity. And even if we don't know what that's going to be, they're just possibilities. And, and, you know, the, the adage possibilities are endless. They really are. They're things that are such incredible opportunities that come from change. Uh, I would recommend anybody who's thinking about change, go ahead and you know acknowledge the fear that goes with it, but don't let it stop you. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Right. Uh, so yeah, recognize that there's fear. I would say you know 
sit with the fear a little bit. So figure yeah. out what that fear is and where it's coming from. And at the same time, don't let it hold you back. Right. Because we never know. There's good things to be found out there. There are, definitely. And uh, I'm also curious about, um, for you, you know, who has been uh, a, a big influence on your life or a career that really contributes to who you are now or to your work that you're doing? Well, I was very, very fortunate in that both of my parents were entrepreneurs uh, at different stages in their lives. My father left Boeing in the 60s, and he started a company that started out being filming in Glacier Bay. And I don't even know what he thought he was going to do with these films, but he had, uh, when he was in college and out of college, he had helped build homes. And he ended up somehow uh, designing hotels and restaurants. He started his own company. Um, it was a company here in town that he designed, you know, a restaurant at the top of the Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. Oh. And he did some pretty big things for a guy that didn't have a degree in architecture or engineering and had architects and engineers sign off on his drawings. Uh, he was one of those that just didn't believe in, in you know, anybody saying no, basically. When I was young, I would say, you know, little kids go through all sorts of different things. At one point, I thought I wanted to be a hairdresser. He'd say, great, own the salon. And then at some point, I, I wanted to be a flight attendant because I wanted to fly around the world. He's like, great, own the airline. So he, he had just an outlook that was, if at all possible, be your own boss. And it's not possible for all people. For me, it's, it's you know, I've finally gotten there four years ago. Um, and my mom designed, she was an editorial consultant. She was the art director for Alaska Magazine. And then I think she was probably, it was after she retired, like you were talking about earlier. She ended up helping people self-publish books and she designed them. So she worked for the Anesthesiology Society. She worked for people who wrote their own poetry books or a book on antique silver service that, you know, a publisher wouldn't have necessarily picked up. But she worked, I think her last book she worked on, she was in her early 90s. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. Sounds like both, both your folks had just wonderful experiences and how fun. Yeah, it's really it really was. They were, they were good people and I learned a lot from them. Excellent. Nice. I love those stories. Just so fun to hear about and people's different adventures and very cool. So thanks so much, Adrian, for sharing about your path and journey and your lessons learned. We really appreciate it. And it's already time for our next break. So when we come back, Adrian and I will talk in more detail about making successful transitions into senior housing. Hi, I'm Lisa Downs, career and retirement transition coach and host of Reigniting You on KIXI. I guide age 40 plus professionals to gain clarity, a renewed sense of purpose, and a career transition plan within 90 days so you can lead a fulfilling life regardless of your age. If you're not sure what's next for you, I can help. Let's talk about what your future can look like. Visit yournewaspect.com or call me at 425-216-3015. That's 425-216-3015. New Aspect Coaching, fresh perspectives for your career. Have a career transition related question or want to share your best or worst job story? Call 360-436-6496. That's 360-436-6496. Just leave a voicemail and we'll answer your question or share your story on a future show. Stay tuned for more Reigniting You with Lisa Downs. Back to Reigniting You, the show that discusses timely issues and topics about career transitions for Gen Xers and Boomers. I'm your host, Lisa Downs. A reminder that if you'd like to get in touch, you can head on over to my website, yournewaspect.com. There you can download and take my free career transition readiness quiz. You can also sign up to receive my free weekly career tips e-newsletter or just drop me a note. would be great to hear from you. That's yournewaspect.com. So we're here with my guest, senior housing consultant, Adrian Miller. So Adrian, let's go ahead and dive back into our conversation. 
Many people may not have realized until today and our conversation that senior housing advisory and placement services is an industry or that there are professionals like you out there to help seniors find a good housing fit. So uh, how are you able to spread the word about this aside from being here on the show today? Well, once again, thank you for having me on the show today. This is a great opportunity. Uh, the thing that I found when I started my company four years ago is that so few people actually know that there is assistance like what I provide. Senior housing advisors, um, the phrase doesn't necessarily roll right off the tongue, um, but it's a highly important industry, especially for families um, going through any kind of um, transition for senior housing and care. A lot of the business that I have managed to uh, bring in over the last four years is really by um, networking. Uh, there are a lot of different industries out there that actually can use help for their clients and what I want to be is a resource for them. So there are attorneys that work with families uh, and uh, there are elder law attorneys. There are financial um, planners. There are retirement planners like you. There are trust bankers. Um, there are social workers. So there are a lot of different people who actually need someone like me. Uh, they don't have the time or the resources to figure it out, but they absolutely have the need. So I've spent a lot of time just telling my story and sharing it with those who I might be able to be just one piece of the puzzle for them or a tool in their toolbox. That's great. Yeah, I, I know, you know, until I started getting into working with older workers and, and helping people with kind of the life planning for retirement, I wasn't aware that it was an industry either <laughs> until oh, I met you. <laughs> you know? yeah. That's why I appreciate being here, Lisa. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. And um, so for, because, you know, there's not only the seniors, right, that, that you're placing into the, the communities, but there's also the adult children. So folks who are sandwich generation, right? So Absolutely. our age and, you know, raising kids and then um, assisting with elder care or, you know, concern for their parents and family members. So for those busy adult children who need to... Um, children of seniors who need to be in one of the communities or have increased levels of care, how can you ease some of the pressure and stress of finding a place for their parents? It, it, there's a huge amount of stress in, in this process. And it's terrifying to think of placing or referring or moving your parent to a community, um, especially if you've been doing the hands-on care. You know that you can care for this person but can somebody else? And what's what's going to happen there? And how are the caregivers trained? And, and will mom be okay behind that closed door if she moves into an apartment? And all of those things can just stop people from moving forward with a move that will both help oftentimes the senior get care that maybe they can't get at home because professional caregivers are doing it, and also hugely relieve the stress on not only the son or daughter, but their immediate family. Yeah. So the fact that I can take a look at the state's inspection reports and, and take a look and see what's been going on in that community. Basically what I do is I do the legwork to reduce the overwhelming options out there and reduce it down to what is a good fit for that particular person. So it, it saves time, it saves stress, and hopefully it will give family members a confidence that I know the communities and I match them with those needs. Gotcha. And uh, what are any the laws or regulations that you have to follow here in Washington State to do your work? Are there any licenses or certifications you have to have or specific laws for it? So I, there are no certifications that are required, uh, but there is a law. And Washington State was the first state in the country back in 2012 to enact a law that comes to um, referring seniors or vulnerable people to housing. And we were really at the forefront in the entire country of this. And this law really lays out what we in our industry can and can't do, including uh, requiring a disclosure of these services so that anyone who wants to work with us has it in writing. Um, there's also, we ask for a HIPAA release so we can share medical information. 
Uh, we also, in that, there are very specific questions that we're required to ask to make sure that this is a fit. This isn't just, oh, this is a senior and there's a community and they have an apartment open. It really is designed to make sure that it, it, we are working on the very specific needs and wants. Sometimes it's that a senior doesn't have a lot of care issues, but they're lonely. So what, what kind of activities, what kind of community would they like? And so we need to ask those questions to make sure that we can provide that. Mm -hmm. And to follow up on that, um, how did you go about learning all of that? Uh, <laughs> honestly, I, I just rolled up my sleeves and dug in and, uh, I didn't have any background in this industry, but I ended up placing my aunt, uh, in the fall of 2016. And so the process that I went to, I realized that there was a huge need out there, that there were some resources, but probably not enough. And so when I started, I just started Googling senior industry meetings. Um, someone told me about the law and I dug into that. Um, and then from there, it was as much education as I could get. I'm a big learner and I'm an information junkie. And so little by little, and I had some great mentors. There are some very, very generous people in this industry who understand that we're not competitors. We call each other co-competitors. And we believe that there is room for all of us and there's a huge need for even more than the few of us that are doing this. And they were very kind with their time and information. Excellent, that's so cool. I like that word, co-competitors. I think that's, that's pretty <laughs> cool. And um, how has the pandemic impacted your work and placement of your clients or their parents into senior housing, you know, especially with how hard the senior community was hit with COVID? That was devastating. And the fact that here in Washington at the Skilled Nursing Center, we were the first hit in the country. Um, and there was a lot of fear that went with that and very well-founded fear. So business was off some last year because some families did put off moving people to care. Um, those that were able to keep uh, family members at home, many of them did so. And I'm not sure that I would have made any other decision. But for some, it was impossible. There were folks with uh, physical care needs, dementias, that it was just impossible for them to stay home. And so with that, we did the best that we could. We couldn't go into communities to tour them in person like we, we do regularly. Um, we relied on Zoom meetings. It, 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 we got inventive, um, but it was a really scary time. And we're fortunate that here in our state, um, we're highly vaccinated now, both caregivers and those that are living in communities. And they've opened back up and families can be together and I can tour and people can see in person what this experience will be like for their loved one. That's great. It was so touching and heart-wrenching when uh, things you know, started to open up again and we could have more in-person contact with each other. And just, you know, they would have it on the news and the stories of, of grandkids being able to see their grandparents again and go Absolutely. back to the senior communities to interact with their family. And, and um, yeah, just it was so over hard. a year and yeah, over a year in some communities that people were visiting via Zoom or through glass mm -hmm. windows. Wow. Yes. But, you know, so glad we are where we are. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And that things are improving at least a bit by a bit. And and I'm also wondering what some additional concerns or considerations are for placing someone that families are faced with when it comes to care. Well, care is always first and foremost. That should be the very first thing that people look at. But unfortunately, um, financial concerns sometimes supersede those. Uh, sometimes people have to go where they can afford, not where they need. And, and that's a shame, but senior care is not inexpensive here or really anywhere in the country. Um, so the financial piece is one that if families are able to plan for this, they should. And they need to be paying attention to the fact that many, many people, now that we have such an aging population, which is fabulous, medicine is having us live longer. But with that, oftentimes comes some sort of care need. And, you know, I, I forget the statistics, but I think that if you hit 65, you probably have a 20% chance of needing some sort of care. And if you hit 75, it, it doubles that you know, or maybe even more. 
So if we live a long life, we may need some care and we need to plan for it um, because that financial piece should not be more important than the care that people receive. Yeah, that longevity piece is huge, right? And it's the same uh, with me, you know, working with clients on, okay, what are you going to do with yourself? <laughs> so, right? you know, yeah, you make it to the certain age and odds, odds go up exponentially that you're going <laughs> to make it, you know, well, you know, maybe to your 90s, maybe even into triple digits. So that's a lot to think about and a lot of time to plan for. Too, yeah. very We're, there's some good things happening out there, you know, getting p information to people on long-term care insurance. I don't get into the politics of that, but there's a lot that people should consider and people, we all like to think that we will live a, a, you know, a great long life and die in our sleep at the age of 105. Unfortunately, it doesn't usually work that yeah. way. So planning is a better way to go. Yeah, completely agree. And, uh, and also uh, curious about how you work with clients in terms of how you get paid. So do you operate on commission from the senior communities or do you charge clients directly for your services or operate on a different model? So the industry standard is that uh, referral professionals are paid a referral fee, a commission from the communities that we refer to. Okay. The only time that that doesn't come into play is if someone is uh, having their housing covered by Medicaid. So their housing is covered by the state. And in that instance, the state says that any money that they pay into a community shouldn't then go back out the door to a referral agent. So the state does not allow someone on Medicaid to have a referral fee paid. But other than that, if people have you know money in the bank or long-term care insurance or VA benefits, as long as it's a private pay situation, and the communities pay my fee, and there is no fee at all to the families. Gotcha. Okay. Well, it's good to know uh, for how all that works. And I was curious. I, I was thinking, well, is it kind of like a real estate agent, or you know, sort of, of okay. yeah. <laughs> sort of. It's yeah. Cool. And um, what would you say is uh, when you think about your clients, those you've worked with? What is a success story, client success story that stands out to you um, that, that really sticks with you? I had the honor of working with a family where there was a senior uh, who was disabled and um, was living in uh, an apartment building on his own, uh, but he was being taken advantage of by some pretty awful people. Mm. And he didn't fully recognize or recognize at all that they were taking advantage of him, both financially um, and in his apartment, utilizing his space. And so uh, his family reached out to me to see if I could find a place that was actually local to where he lived. He was taking the bus places. He was fully involved in a YMCA. He had a, a, a lifestyle that he they didn't want to take him out of, but mm -hmm. to be able to find a care situation that was in that particular area that allowed him to maintain that independence, but get him out of an unsafe situation wasn't the easiest placement uh, opportunity. But I was fortunate to find a, a new home for him that allowed him to move, uh, to have some care that he wasn't getting, to be in a safe situation and not take him completely out of his routine. And after all was said and done and he was safe in his new home, his niece said that I saved his life. Oh. And I felt pretty honored about that. That's amazing. What an impact. Yeah. He, he ended up in a very good place. And it could have been a very sad end to his story. And, and I was, again, honored to be involved and so happy that we found a great place for him. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's that's pretty amazing and uh, and so good to hear and for him to have a good outcome you know that that you really uh, had that helping hand in and that support I'm sure for his family to to get him into such a much better situation was an enormous relief yeah it was it was a great situation he wasn't happy about having to move yeah but a, after a very short time he realized what it, what a good situation it was I, again back to change nobody really likes it but there are right. positive <laughs> outcomes when we actually embrace it yeah yeah definitely and um and 
What do you wish people knew about the journey of and the issues with navigating senior housing that are often missed or that, you know, we just don't think about because we're so busy and have work and families and everything until we're faced with an urgent need? Unfortunately, it's that urgent need piece that comes into play. Um, people wait too long, uh, and it's for a variety of reasons. Um, we, uh, as adult children, we defer to our parents. We, in general, been taught we don't get to tell them what to do. They tell us what to do. And so when adult children see their parents needing to make a move um, and there's hesitation, oftentimes we back off. It, it, you know, mom said no. And sometimes that's not what's best for mom. So it takes crisis, it takes a last minute, it takes a fall, um, it, it takes something that is not the way anybody would want to have to move in and find care. So planning, uh, plan ahead, uh, talk to your family members, talk about, especially with those that uh, either are aging and have some care issues, or perhaps one spouse has died and there's a bit of isolation and loneliness and, and start having conversations and don't be afraid of them. This is actually a positive thing. And there are so many communities out there. I think that a lot of us, especially of a certain age, tend to think of what were in the 50s, 60s, 70s nursing homes. Mm -hmm. And there were places nobody wanted to go. And these days, assisted livings and adult family homes are bright and beautiful and full of wonderful people and activities. And it, they're good places to be. Excellent. Great points. So thank you so much for that, Adrian. And last question is, how can people find you if they'd like to get in touch? Well, thank you for that. My website is uh, forevercareservices.com. Uh, there is a button on there that you can click for find a community. It takes you to a contact page. And even if you're not looking for a community, you just want to ask me some questions, I'm always happy to answer those. You can also reach me by phone at 206-383-2001. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here, Adrian, and all of your great uh, recommendations, information, and tips. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me today. You bet. Good to talk with you. And it's time now for my reignition recommendation to wrap up today's show. And that's your weekly career transition tip, regardless of your age. So my tip for you this week is to clean house. You know, we are getting to that time end of the year when we're evaluating how our year went and looking ahead, starting to look ahead for the new year. So in this time, and as we tend to have a bit more downtime uh, when we're coming up on all the, the holidays in a row, what do you need to do to clean house? And by that, I mean, you know, what do you need to take care of when it comes to your career or life transition? Perhaps it's something you've been putting off for a little bit, or, you know, you just need to organize some information or come up with a plan of action in terms of what you're going to do here as we close out 2021 and get ready for 2022. Or are there any relationships in your life that you need to tend to and clean up a little bit? that could help you move forward toward your goals and what you want to accomplish next in your life. Uh, but where, you know, take a look, where do you need to clean house? And a reminder that if you'd like to get in touch, you can head on over to my website, yournewaspect.com. There you can download and take my free career transition readiness quiz, as well as sign up to receive my free weekly career tips e-newsletter. Or just get in touch with me, send me a note. That's yournewaspect.com. Would love to hear from you. And I hope you take advantage of the resources there on my website. Uh, so Eric, thanks for your support as always. So uh, what did you find interesting from our time with Adrian today? Oh, great conversation. First of all, I think we're a lot of us sooner or later are going to be in this position where we need to think about where our, our parents are going to be living, you yeah. know, for their final days. And uh, like so much in life, planning ahead, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, <laughs> is very important. So we're not caught off guard uh, in an emergency situation, as, uh, you know, Adrian said, you know, you don't yeah. want to wait till that 
first fall or something like that. You know? Right. Yeah. Some sort of urgent or emergency situation. Mm -hmm. And yeah, how can we get ahead of it a little bit? And because as we know, the one thing we all universally have in common is aging. Yeah. And you got to make sure the family's on the same page so that there's not a big fight and argument when yep. it comes to do it. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, join us next Monday at three o'clock when my guest will be intellectual property and patent attorney, Dan Schulman. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week on Reigniting You. Thank you.